so we're going to talk about, uh, first off, I'm Jeff Cross. I'm from Narwhal. Yeah. I'm Caitlin Ekdahl. I'm a developer at T-Mobile. And we're going to talk about some interesting, cool stuff we've been working on together. So today we have for you a very simple shopping application. It's something you would see maybe on T-Mobile.com, where we just have a simple phone browse page where you can see some phones. And then when you click on one, you can see some details about that phone. Uh, two things to keep in mind here. I want you to pay close attention to in the upper right corner, we can see there's a personalized message. And then below the, uh, below the description, we have some financing options. So when we set out to build this, you know, we wanted to define some business requirements and talk about what's important with this application. So we want the phones to be displayed on the screen as soon as possible. Even if the page isn't interactive, we want the user to be able to see something and feel like it's loading. And then when it becomes interactive, you know, they've already kind of decided what they want to do. And so, you know, this is the typical case for pre-rendering, which we're not going to get into a whole lot of why and when to pre-render today. Let's just assume that, that we will end up going that way. We also want the pages to be search engine crawlable. We want the search engines to not have any problems rendering our page. And uh, we want to personalize the page so that users are more likely to find what they want and more likely to convert to customers. So we want to uh, take what we know about the user and form the page to them to fit what they're looking for. So in particular, uh, Caitlin showed the account widget at the top of the screen. We want to like, let the user know, yes, you're logged in. You could log out if you want. Uh, here's your, a picture of yourself just so you remember what you look like. And uh, for some users, they should see financing options. So if we know the user and we know their credit score or credit worthiness, we want to be able to show them some options on different ways they can buy the phone rather than just paying out of pocket. But that's only for select users of the application, not for everyone. So uh, we've decided, you know, we want to get something on the screen quickly. Pre-rendering is the best way to do that. You know, pre-rendering lets us get something in front of the user rendered before any JavaScript is loaded or, or executed. So we're going to do pre-rendering, but we need to evaluate the costs of pre-rendering to determine what the right pre-rendering strategy is for our application. So in general, pre-rendering is, it takes computation. There's a, there's a maybe constant, maybe not constant amount of time that it takes anytime you pre-render a page. And so, you know, Angular, when you run the platform server rendering, it's even that's just doing some work. But especially if you have async operations that you have to do while you're pre-rendering, like if I'm fetching user data from a database or making HTTP calls to an API, that's going to add even more time to the, the rendering process. So that, that has a big impact on when and how we pre-render our pages. The key thing is we don't want to incur any of these costs in the request lifecycle. When a user requests a page, we don't want to be doing that computation as part of that lifecycle because that's going to slow down the rendering of the page. And across any application, not just in this application, the optimal user experience is to pre-render everything out of band of the, the request lifecycle. At build time or at some kind of change, you want to have all these pages built and cached, ready to just serve to the user from a cache. That's not always tenable, and usually there's some hybrid strategy that, uh, that you want to apply, uh, but uh, this is the, the optimal. So in our case, we chose the pre-rendering strategy of, uh, or we, we had some constraints. We, we did a little bit of measurement to see, okay, exactly how costly is it for us to pre-render? And these are example numbers. These aren't real numbers from, from our use case, but uh, let's say it takes uh, 100 milliseconds to render a bunch of pages in a batch. I do a script, we're rendering 10 pages, 100 pages. On average, it's 100 milliseconds. Uh, but if we render a personalized page, or we're having to make calls to a user database to uh, compute things and understand what options we should show to a user and generate a page for them. And if we do it one at a time, it's 400 milliseconds. So if we did it at request time, this is probably the cost we'd be incurring as part of the request lifecycle. So if we let's say we have thousands of products and we have then thousands of pre-rendered pages if we just render one page per product. But if we want, want to personalize each page and render each product page for every user at build time. That's going to be billions of pages we have to pre-render. And you know, that's, that's a long time to wait for a CI job to finish and deploy to production, uh, even though there's lots of Twitter to read in the meantime. So the, the chosen strategy we went with was we're going to pre-render and cache all of our phone detail pages offline, not at request time. Uh, that's going to save us 400 milliseconds each visit because we're just pulling this, this pre-rendered page for, from a cache serving it to the user right away, no computation, other than just grabbing that page and serving it to them. 
The key is we can have no user-specific content in this pre-rendered page. So this is a constraint we've imposed on ourselves. In the real world, this might be a little bit different. You might pre-render a subset of your pages because you know, if you have a lot of products and variations of things like that, you'll probably want to choose the most popular pages and then do the others lazily. But let's just say for this example, we're going to render all pages at build time and, uh, and that's the best strategy. So again, to reiterate, to drastically reduce the pre-rendering workload uh, in the request lifecycle, all users, and you know, in general, to re reduce the pre-rendering work, all users are going to see the same unpersonalized pre-rendered page. So let's talk a little bit about the page states that Jeff talked about. So we can think of our page states as two discrete states. We have our pre-rendered state. This is going to be before our client loads, and it's not going to have any of that personalized content that we've discussed so far. Then we have our personalized state after the client loads and the application is aware of the current user. We can populate that data. So how do we design for these two states? Well, there are a few rules we can follow to make sure we're making the best user experience for these two discrete states. For one, we can make sure that our page layout isn't ever rearranged. We don't want things being moved around when the client loads and we start to populate that personalized data. We should also make sure the content shouldn't abruptly shift. When we do have to add stuff to our page, we don't want to inject it in between some divs. For example, like if you're scrolling through Reddit and you have like the ad load between the posts and you accidentally click on it, that's terrible design. Don't do that. Moreover, we want to make sure our text doesn't change. So if we have to um, change the value of some value of some data on the page, we want to make sure that we're not actually changing that text because it could be misleading. So here are some examples of that. If our, in our pre-rendered page, we want to make sure that when we do actually load our content, we're not moving the phone to the wrong side of the screen. We don't want to inject this content where it shouldn't be. We also want to avoid abrupt shifts. If we do have to add content, we want to make sure it's being tacked on at the end where it's not intrusive, and we want to make sure we have a smooth transition so it's not just jumping in there. And then finally, if we do have to display some constant data, we don't want to add some text change when the client does load. Um, we would prefer more of a placeholder in this case, because it might be misleading if I come to a page and I'm expecting to see my greeting message to greet me personally. I am not a guest. So it's helpful to think about your UI in terms of two discrete states and then consider the transition from the one state to another. Uh, and that's a good way to think about it. Another way to think about your, um, your pre-rendering transition is classifying your components. And for our case, we classify components, our personalized components, in two categories, either constant or conditional. So every component that's personalized, we determine is it constant or conditional, and we use that to determine the strategy. So a constant component, we, we say, is available, is visible to all users. So regardless of what we find out about the user, the component is going to be there. The content inside is just going to be different depending on something. But the structure, the dimensions, it's going to be the same for everybody. Whereas a conditional component is only going to be visible to some users based on what we find out about that user after the page has bootstrapped. So in our case, the financing uh, component is a conditional component. We only show it if we know enough about the user to know what options they have for financing. So in our case, the strategy we chose for the conditional component was to expand it vertically. So when, when the pre-rendered page is loaded, this element has a height of zero. It's probably not even shown. But when we find out that it is available and we populate the content, then we animate it into place uh, by expanding the height of it. And we've also placed it at the end of the content here so that the, the flow of content below it isn't disrupted by it expanding. So uh, we have a nice smooth transition from the pre-rendered state to the, the fully rendered personalized state. And our constant component is the profile. Even if you're a guest, not logged in, or you are logged in, or whatever kind of user you are, you're going to see this so you know that you're, you're logged in, you know your state. And so we are going ahead and we're using a ghost element strategy for this. We know it's going to be there, so we want to reserve that place in the, space, the page. We want the user to see something's going to be here. You can probably tell by the shape what it is. And, uh, and when it's available and when we know who they are, then we populate it. 
Now, to Caitlin's point earlier, we don't replace text. We don't start with some text and replace it with other text because that would be confusing. You would actually be lying to the user saying, hi, guest, because you don't know if they're a guest. You know they're a logged in user. So uh, defining components of these two states helps you think more clearly, or these two types of components, helps you think more clearly about your strategy for placing it on the page and how it will transition. So you can plot it on axis like this, just to reiterate. We have on one, our UI state, which is either pre-rendered or personalized, and then our component type, and then we see the, uh, the strategies we use, the ghost element for the constant, the, uh, the smooth transition for the conditional, and everyone is happy. At least I'm happy. <laughs> so we have our strategy for personalization and how to make it more performant. performant. How do we plan for this when we start actually designing our application? There are a few things we can do to make sure we're planning for our personalization on our personalized content. I think the most important point is to make sure the designers and the developers are on the same page. They should all be in the same room during the design phase and talking about what the behavior of the application should be, of course. The designers should consider the conditional personalized content uh, meaning the content that may not be there for every user. How does that page look if it is there versus when it isn't there? Designers should also consider where the constant personalized data should be and what the placeholder should be for our pre-rendered state. Also, the designers should help figure out what that transition should look like when we go from our pre-rendered state to our personalized content state. What is the behavior? What is the animation or transition? But uh, you know we can't put all the onus on designers. It's up to us as developers being the last line of defense to make sure we're not shipping things that are going to make for these awkward, jumpy transitions from our pre-rendered state to our personalized state. And this applies not to just personalized, but anything that's dynamic that you're determining after a page is pre-rendered, uh, making sure that you, as the final person to touch that UI, that you're taking responsibility for making sure it's a great user experience when you're testing it, uh, when you're doing QA, and uh, when you're developing it. So that's the most important bit. That's, you, we can't blame designers for everything, right? True. <laughs> we tried, it doesn't work. We actually love designers. I used to yes. be one. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, the, we're uh, happy to talk about this. It's really fun. If you want to work on cool, interesting things like this, you can. We're hiring a ton of engineers. Work at if you're interested, you can apply or learn more information at tmobile.com slash careers. Also, Narwhal, we're hiring if you want to work on cool things <laughs> with, with cool clients. Uh, can we you also do a show of hands where you'd rather work. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> We don't give free phones away. Do you get free phones? I phone? don't get free oh. phones. <laughs> I wish. Maybe I would give a free phone if you join Narwhal. Um. Uh, not in particular. Anyone. Okay, if you join <laughs> Narwhal, I'll give you a free phone. Um, just one, though. Uh, also, so we launched our, our platform yesterday, Narwhal Connect. Uh, this is a place where we're, we've kind of made it our knowledge base, uh, where we're, we're sharing things we've learned over the years uh, of working with clients. We, we're taking all the lessons learned, a lot of interesting things, a lot like this, what we're talking about today and things like this, where we've produced books, articles, cookbook recipes, things like that, and put it into one place that's free for anyone to take advantage of. Uh, please go check that out. We're really excited about it. Uh, it's super early and we've got a lot to do, but already I'm pretty proud and excited of it. Um, and uh, for the, we have a demo app, so it's broken right now. I'm gonna fix it after this. <laughs> I pushed it at 2 a.m. and I told Caitlin, hey, it works, good night. And then it didn't actually work. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to fix it and then you can go check it out. Um, but uh, you can go to this link and go to the repository now so you can at least bookmark it and then you can watch the commits to see when I push the fixes. But uh, that's it. And by the way, this was uh, Caitlin's first talk. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. So it's, it's trial by fire because it was not easy preparing a talk with me because I do things at the last minute and she oh, likes yeah, to prepare. Oh yeah, that's something but, I didn't know about Jeff uh, until like 2 a.m. last night. So. You should have asked my coworkers. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, so thank you. Uh, happy to chat more about uh, some lessons learned or anything else. So thank you. Thank you.